it gives me great pleasure to introduce our very first speaker, and it's appropriate that he's the first speaker, uh, speaking on uh, the basics you need to know about prostate cancer. Prostate Cancer 101, my friend and colleague, uh, Peter Carroll. Uh, Eric, thank you very much. Am I going to pull this up here? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, like Eric said, it takes a lot of people to organize a conference like this, and I'd like to thank everyone for doing this, especially Adina, who I sent her slides every morning and night. Thank you for your patience on this. ABCs of prostate cancer. I think prostate cancer staging, uh, early detection has become fine, fine art. Uh, the important questions for patients are, should I be screened? If I undergo screening and, I, screening and I have cancer, should I be treated? If I want to be treated, how should I be treated? And importantly, if I'm treated, what can I expect? Cancer cure rates, uh, side effects. Uh, if I go fast forward over the last 30 years, I think uh, prostate cancer early detection and staging has really become a very fine art compared to what it was 10, 20, and 30 years ago. And you'll hear this in this morning session. Uh, in the past, we looked at simple cancer grade and volume, but now we have new technology, new forms of imaging, genetic profiling, and you'll hear a lot about this. Uh, the things we usually look for when we, we look at prostate cancer assessment is things called cancer grade, the stage, the anatomical extent, the number of cores involved, so-called cancer volume, serum PSA, and actually prostate uh, patient age. Um, uh, you know, when we kind of look at this, it's really evolved over time. Uh, and if we look at this issue of grade, you know, when we look at grade, grade means how malignant the cells look under the microscope, from cells that look like normal tissue to cells that look wildly different. And we generally grade from three through five. And now we have these grade groups again. Grade group one is three, three, go three, four, four, three, and then at least an eight, nine, or 10. And these actually predict outcomes. This is biochemical free survival by grade group uh, looking at uh, the UCSF cohort. Uh, in the past, we've depended a lot on forms of, of, of imaging, bone scan, and CT scan, and they become largely irrelevant because of immense stage migration, which has occurred over the last 20 years because of PSA early detection. So early on in my career, about 30% of the patients who presented with prostate cancer presented with metastatic disease. That's dropped to around 2 to 3%. In fact, most of the patients who present who have metastatic disease are patients who were thought to have early stage disease, were treated, and then fail. Uh, this is a slide I borrowed from Matt Cooperberg, and he'll expand on this. There's a lot of ways to look at uh, cancer assessment. Uh, frequently, it's put into three groups, you know, uh, we call low grade, intermediate, or uh, high risk disease. We think that's not good enough, and here at UCSF, we developed an instrument that actually predicts for biochemical recurrence, advanced disease, and this is something called UCSF CAPRA score, and Matt will talk again about this. Very simple uh, to uh, calculate. It's a zero through 10 score. It's been validated in tens of thousands of patients around the world. Uh, you get points based on PSA, Gleason score, a stage, you know, confined to the prostate, just beyond the prostate, the percent positive biopsies, and patient age. This is very predictive, and not only predicts for biochemical free survival after surgery or radiation therapy, but actually predicts for prostate cancer specific survival and overall survival. Very few uh, risk assessment tools uh, do that. And we think there's considerable advantage of using these what we call multivariable risk assessment tools rather than rely, uh, relying on simple classifications. I need to say something about African-American men. They have a higher incidence of prostate cancer, uh, increased prostate cancer mortality, earlier stage of di age of diagnosis compared to Caucasians. Uh, this may be attributable to a greater risk of developing preclinical prostate cancer and a higher likelihood that a preclinical uh, tumor will, will, will spread over time. Now, we have some recent uh, data from UCSF to suggest this might be, may not be true if you control for access to care and good quality care. And actually, uh, because of this, we, we uh, recommend that African-American men consider screening at an earlier age and perhaps more frequent screening compared to Caucasian men because we simply do not have enough African-American men in the screening courts to determine exactly how they should be screened. 
Um, uh, nice data showing that, in fact, the racial differences in survival may be reduced by standardizing treatment and, and equal access to care. As I've mentioned, uh, early data from UCSF suggested, in fact, if you go to the right center, you, you have access to good care, that, in fact, you'll minimize impact, any impact on ethnicity. Now, there are several new options, and I'm going to briefly discuss on the, briefly show these because uh, they've had a remarkable impact on my practice, and these will be highlighted by the speakers in this session. Remarkable increase in molecular profiling and novel forms of imaging. This has had a profound impact on how we assess prostate cancer, how we treat it, uh, and how we can predict outcomes. Uh, there's a lot of commercial tools at our disposal, these genetic profiles. Matt's going to talk a little bit about this. All of these have been validated at UCSF. Uh, some uh, underwent their initial validation here. These are tests that actually allow you, uh, independent of cancer grade and stage, to determine for pet men like you, what is your, what can you expect? So it adds detail, and Matt will show this waterfall plot over time. To these, these genetic profiles should be considered, uh, uh, they have many uses, but actually we use them most often for men who might be considering active surveillance, and these tests actually predict which men on active surveillance will progress over time uh, or need more uh, careful evaluation. Um, uh, Multiparametric MRI has taken the world by storm here, and uh, this is a test that actually determines who might need a biopsy. We're actually trying to determine, we're trying to decrease biopsy rates. You know, if you take 1,000 U.S. men, about 250 will have an elevated PSA. At that 250, about half will not have prostate cancer. We call it false positive. They didn't need a biopsy. Of those who had prostate cancer, about 40% had low risk disease who may not even need to be detected. So here at UCSF, we've been able to decrease biopsy rates by about 30 to 40% using new forms of risk assessment, including MRI. This better stages cancer uh, uh, compared to most modalities, although here at UCSF, actually ultrasound performed by experienced providers actually does as well as MRI. Uh, it does allow us to assess cancer aggressiveness. We call it a PIRAD score. PIRADs one and two, uh, essentially normal, three indeterminate, four or five associated with higher risk disease. It allows targeted biopsy. and may allow us to determine who on active surveillance needs more frequent biopsy or assessment. I want to point out there's been uh, some very uh, easy new tools to assess. One is this issue of cancer grade. And as I mentioned, you grade uh, cells uh, really three, four, and five. What we determine now is grade group four cells actually can be subtyped into different histologic types. And it's an easy thing to do, rarely done by pathologists. It's actually being standardized here at UCSF. And depending on your this uh, Gleason grade subtype, it predicts outcome, and we have three publications coming from, out from UCSF shortly, which will show, depending on your grade group four subclassification, we can predict who's harboring higher risk disease and who is not. Actually, it also actually correlates very well with genomic scores. So again, genomic scores are, are high-priced items, and in fact, we may be able to substitute something that is freely available on all pathology reports. And we think that the histologic subtype should be reported routinely on all uh, prostate biopsy specimens. Uh, PET imaging is again taken the world by storm. Uh, uh, choline, PSMA, and uh, fluziclovine, uh, PSMA, uh, uh, PET scanning has transformed the way we evaluate our patients, both at the time of diagnosis and at the time of recurrence. For me, in the last two years, this has been an eye-opener as to how we treat and evaluate our patients. And Tom Hope will talk about this, has led, led a lot of work here at UCSF. This is a patient Eric and I uh, uh, have treated from Mexico who actually had three negative biopsies. Biopsy found cancer uh, on advanced imaging, and this is a patient who had normal CT scan. I won't run through the movie here, but this PSMA PET scan lights up these lymph nodes which were not noted uh, before on standard imaging. I want to point out that using a technology like this, we understand that a lot of the, the things we, the, the, the treatment plans we had were inadequate. So about 40% of the positive lymph nodes in men, either before treatment or at the time of biochemical recurrence, sit, out the standard, sit outside the standard fields for both radiation and surgery. So PET imaging has allowed us to uh, direct our therapy, I think, a little bit more precisely and evaluate our patients uh, more precisely. 
germline testing, I think this will be highlighted, but again, uh, this again has become more common. Those with a strong family history, certainly those with first degree relatives, early age of onset, advanced disease should consider this. People with Lynch syndrome, introductal cancers, uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancers, and there's now panels been recommended by national groups to screen these. Again, this is germline testing, you know, you know your cell, all your cells in these inherited risk features. Uh, some mutations actually sit outside this panel, so now there's a thought we should actually uh, broaden this panel, and African American men actually have lower rates of germline variants. Uh, treatment decisions, as Stan said, are based on the stage, grade, volume of cancer, PSA, additional testing, including biomarkers, age and health of the patient, and as Stan mentioned, individual patient preferences play a very strong role. I am showing you here on one side of the screen, uh, we think it's very important to understand our patients very well. There are validated questionnaires that assess men's baseline function, urinary bowel, and sexual function. Knowing what that baseline function looks like allows us to determine or predict how they respond to certain forms of treatment. So we think we need to know our patients much better when we're selecting treatment uh, decisions. So some myths about someone, I, I came across this slide about 10 or 15 years ago, someone asked me to come up with 10 myths about prostate cancer, I pulled that out. So one myth is that prostate cancer is always slow growing and should, you should not be concerned about. Not true. Uh, this is still a potentially lethal disease. Uh, prostate cancer is usually formally treated. Not true, most men have more than one option. Prostate cancer always needs to be treated immediately. This is a single thing men object to if you ask them a year later, what would they have done differently? They usually would select the same treatment, but they said they wish they had not rushed. Very rarely does a man need to rush to treatment. Uh, there is nothing I can do to help treat my prostate cancer. Not true, June Chan and others will talk to you about the impact of lifestyle modification, other things. Prostate cancer occurring in younger men is more aggressive than occurring in older men, just the opposite. Older men present with worse disease even when you control for PSA cancer grade. Uh, uh, treatment of prostate cancer can be delivered with no side effects, not true. We just need to try and quantitate those side effects. So there's no, like, like most things in life, there's no free ride. Um, my doctor uh, will know what is best for me. I'm a doctor, I've been a doctor a long time. Not true. You will know what is best for you. You and your family will know you can do this in conjunction with an experienced provider. A second opinion is not necessary. I would not be treated for anything without a second opinion. Uh, and and uh, what, uh, what shocks me is that many of, uh, many of us will give our, when we buy a car, we'll, 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 we'll We'll spend much more time with the dealer than we do with our physicians. So again, uh, you can buy a, a, a loaf of bread with more transparency than you get healthcare in the United States today. Um, uh, do not consider clinical trial. Uh, clinical trials are important and beneficial, and Raul will talk to you why that, that might be. And some so prostate cancer represents, represents a spectrum of disease and should be managed as such. The disease should be characterized as completely, as completely as possible. As I said to a reporter, I completely support patients' decisions, but they need to make those decisions on the best information available to them, and too frequently, they don't have that information. Do not rush, get educated, review all options, get opinions, and make a good decision for you. Thank you very much. Can we turn this? Uh, Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, we're going to try to do the questions with you passing the questions to the aisle. Uh, if it ends up being not efficient, we'll just send the microphone around. But are there any questions for Dr. Carroll? And it's okay if they're not. That was a, a lot of uh, information. Just pass it down. Any other questions? <laughs> Many of the things that I talked about will be re-emphasized, re-reviewed in the sessions that are following. I've seen those slides. This may be take time, so you may want to just take people, tell me what their questions are, and I'll repeat them. We were going to use the microphone, but I got to Just, we, if we can bring those questions on down, and then uh, we'll just write the questions on a quick piece of paper and bring them on down. And then to, uh, Dr. Carroll, please. Eric, you may we want to screen the others. Yeah, here. I think we're going to probably get people to ask questions from the audience with these portable mics. Yeah. This is going to take too long. 
so, so uh, the, the uh, scorpion venom has been used to illuminate cancer cells. Is this, uh, is this technology being enabled here? Actually, we, we will, in, in the first quarter of, uh, of next year, working with Intuitive uh, Surgical, they have developed a PSMA uh, uh, fluorescent uh, antibody. So we will be able to do, uh, we will be doing a very similar study led by Hao Wen here, where we'll be looking at fluorescent antibody imaging during surgery to assess lymph node involvement uh, and surgical margins. One of the difficult things about a surgeon is when you go to do a lymph node dissection, that these lymph nodes have been illuminated on PSMA pit, they're normal sized. So you, when you go there, you, you, you can't see these, uh, uh, even at 10, 10x. So I think intraoperative imaging and how Wynn has done some remarkable work with intuitive uh, looking at this. So I think this will be a really novel technology, which could be actually implemented very quickly because the intuitive surgical robot has an advanced Fireflay imaging device with it. Peter, let me... Yeah. Let me... Um, I, thanks. Uh, let me ask you a question while you look at those. Um, Someone asked, can the histologic subgroup that you talked about uh, be determined on an already removed prostate, and should it? Yes. The answer is yes. The only thing here is uh, pathologists have to be experienced, so they have to learn how to do this. You know, here at UCSF, the pathologists understand this. There's a consensus on it. You know, uh, any new technology, we, thought, we think about implementation. I, I have a quick question about Kaiser. Uh, my doctor at Kaiser won't do a routine PSA, even if I recommend it. I had Kaiser insurance as a kid, so I, it's a great health care, but it can be very frustrating when we try and work with the patients from Kaiser to get uh, technology which actually exists in Kaiser. Now, we, we work with our physicians, and most of the physicians in Kaiser will respond to get an MRI and things like that. I will let people know who sent questions in. A lot of these we will be addressing during the session, so I'll just let you know. Explain biochemical relapse-free survival, cancer-free for sur overall survival. We'll get to those. Someone else will do that. Uh, how, how, how do we know and judge how to get a good second opinion? We have a whole session on that this afternoon, so we'll get to that. Come to UCSF. <laughs> okay, so I answered that one, so. <laughs> yeah. We have the, time for the, a few the, more questions. The, 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 what do you think caused the rise in death between uh, 2018 and uh, 2019? Uh, Matt and I get asked this all the time. It's unclear uh, what's happened here. Uh, U.S. Preventive Task Force changed the recommendations on screening in 2012. They've been pillared uh, for that. Uh, they've changed the recommendations now, which I think uh, I congratulate them in doing. Uh, but this is a very complex topic, and it's unclear as to what happened here, because there's several things going on. Screening rates went down. Also, at the same time, we developed technology which allowed us to de decrease biopsy rates. So we, would, we started to diagnose fewer lower grade cancers. So this issue that prostate cancer became more aggressive in this time period, why it did that uh, is a matter of much debate, but hopefully that's behind us because the task force changed the recommendations and screening. Peter, is there any way to know how long you've had prostate cancer? And how would you deal with that? Most often, you've had it for a very long time, uh, usually years. Now, we do see, and I have several patients recently, where you do see patients who have a very low PSAs, and you see these cancers explode. Uh, that, that's very unusual. Most patients have a cancer that's probably existed there for some period of time. We frequently can go back in the chart and see evidence of that uh, early on. Uh, but there are some patients the, where, where they develop cancers very rapidly and progress very rapidly. Those are the ones that attract our attention. We're doing most of the work, and Felix will mention this on genomic profiling to better understand uh, those types of cancers. Great. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Carroll.